Thank you, Dale. Well, today we finish our series on the book of 2 Thessalonians, and as many of you are aware, 2 Thessalonians has a lot to do with the day of the Lord and with the second coming of Jesus Christ and prophetic events and issues, and we're going to be con concluding our series today looking at uh, a subject and a topic that at first glance seems incredibly out of place. But once we consider the context and the background of the Apostle Paul and his ministry, along with uh, Silas and Timothy, and what he wrote in 1 Thessalonians, I believe it will become clear that this indeed uh, is a very appropriate and powerful way to conclude his second epistle to this church, uh, which he cared so deeply about. The title of the message is Discipline Within the Church. Discipline Within the Church. And in the title, I'm using the word discipline not in the sense of church discipline, but in the sense of being orderly and organized and productive, uh, that we lead lives that are honoring to God. So discipline within the church, living the Christian life in a manner which would be pleasing to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as such, <clears throat> this message is, for the most part, about work. Now, we live in a culture, we live in a society uh, that at some levels looks at this word as a four-letter word that it's something to be avoided, that it's something that is not to be embraced, that it's something that is a necessary evil. This is a holy word. This is a word that is an instruction from the creator God of heaven and earth. And it is a word that was in place, the concept or the, or, or, or the precept was in place at creation. Prior to the fall, prior to Adam and Eve sinning, when they were still in their state of innocent perfection, God commanded Adam to work in the garden. Look at the creation account that I have on the slide taken from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. That's prior to sin entering into the human race, entering into this world, entering into our universe. So work is a concept, it is a, um, it is a theme, it is a word that captures the will of God. It is something that God did for six days in creation. And then he rested or ceased from his creative work on the seventh day. Now, when I got here today, it was about nine o'clock, and typically I arrive right around nine o'clock, maybe a few minutes before, a few minutes after, and I try to go through the same routine, you know, every Sunday morning when I'm preaching, and I, I noticed today that there was just an incredible <laughs> amount of activity. In, in fact, in recent weeks, uh, there, there have been a number of people who have come early in order to set up for our services. It takes an amazing amount of work to put up our, uh, our lighting, to put up the audiovisual equipment, to run the cables, to make sure everything's plugged in and functioning, to set up the cameras so that our services can be viewed on YouTube and eventually can be uh, viewed live streaming. And so, just a, you know, a, a, an incredible uh, hive of, of, of activity when I arrived today. Um, just a significant number of people. And it struck me that they were all working. They were all being productive. 
They were all doing what God desired them to do so that this service, so that this message, so that John's teaching in the second hour can go out to hundreds, if not thousands of people. I mean, it's a wonderful thing, and it's a wonderful concept. And the people who came and set up this morning, not a single one of them are on paid staff of this church. They did it voluntarily because it's a good thing to do. It's the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at our passage today. And my first point is that discipline in the church, living the Christian life in an orderly way, it's, it's in keeping with the authority of Christ. Let me read for you chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians and verse 6 once again. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. Now, Paul has just finished with what sounds like a benediction in the first five verses. In fact, as I read that for our call to worship this morning, if I didn't know verse 6 followed, I would have expected the book to conclude at that point. Because it sounded like a benediction. But now he moves into a particular need, a particular area that has to be addressed to this church. And he says, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's according to the authority of Christ. Now, in order to appreciate this, we need to look at some other, some other passages as background. I'd like for you, first of all, to turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. This is the account of the 12 disciples being sent out by Jesus Christ. Being sent out by Jesus Christ for the purpose of ministry. And on this occasion, he did something that he had not yet done before. He gave them his authority. Look at verse 1 and following. And having summoned his twelve disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax gatherer, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach. That was the primary focus of their going out. It was to preach the message, to preach the gospel of the kingdom saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, lepers, cast out demons, freely received, freely give. So he gave them his authority so that they could perform these miracles so that when they preached that the, God, that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, what we call the gospel of the kingdom, using the coming kingdom as a means of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, people would receive and accept their message because it had been authenticated by these signs and wonders and miracles that came from the authority of Jesus Christ himself. Okay, now turn over to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And the Apostle Paul, when he was converted on the road to Damascus. And many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with this account. And I want us to look at something that Jesus said in verses 15 and 16. 
But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. This is Jesus speaking to Ananias. Ananias is the one that Paul was sent to in order to receive his sight. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. So Jesus Christ chose the 12 disciples, and he also chose Paul as an apostle. And he appeared as the risen Lord to Shaul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And Paul alludes to that in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where he writes, Am I not free? The answer that is demanded is yes. Am I not an apostle? The answer that is demanded is yes. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And again, a third time, yes. Because he saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and because the risen Lord Jesus Christ personally gave him his authority, the Apostle Paul had the authority of our Lord. And when he commands anybody, whether it's an individual or a local church, when he commands them in the name of Jesus Christ, it is with the authority of Christ himself. Because the apostles were the authorized representatives of Christ after he left this earth and ascended into heaven in majesty and sat on the right hand of the Father until such time as he returns for his bride in the air. So when we talk about apostolic authority, that is the background. It comes directly from Jesus Christ, the authority of Christ. Now, this word command, paran, parangelo, uh, is actually used four different times in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. That's significant. And this command is primarily focused around a particular principle, the principle of living a disciplined and orderly life as a Christian. Paul actually takes 10 verses to develop this command. I mean, it's, it's actually surprising when you, when you think about it in light of, of, of what's transpired in the book up to this point. And so we have the command in the name of the Lord Jesus and the command is do, or excuse me, that they keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life. And that word unruly is the adverb atoktos. And it occurs uh, two times in the New Testament. And both of them are in this chapter. Once here in verse 6 and once here uh, in, in verse 11. And it means out of ranks, unruly, disorderly, deviating from prescribed order or rule. So we're, we're to stay away from brothers and sisters in Christ who live their lives in such a way as to not line up with the directive of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's Paul's point. It's in keeping with the authority of Christ. Second, it's in keeping with apostolic example, verses 7 through 9. And I've got these verses on the slide for you. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to, the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our examples. So 
Two different times, Paul says and calls them to follow their example. Verse 7 and verse 9. And he says that they ought to do it. Now this is a, a small little particle in the Greek language. It's the word day. Delta epsilon iota. Day. And it's, it's a powerful word because it's a word of, of moral necessity or imperative. It's typically translated ought or should or must. And there's real power, emphasis in this word. It's something that is not negotiable. It's something that is not optional. When we're talking about an imperative from the creator God of the universe, it is automatic. It is expected. It is something that we ought to do. We should follow the example of the apostles and their associates. Now, Paul says that they offered themselves as a model. Well, when did they do that? They did that when, when they planted the church, back in Acts chapter 17, when they spent those few short weeks ministering the gospel, teaching the word. They worked hard. They labored night and day so that they wouldn't be a burden to, to any of the believers that would form the church there in Thessalonica. Now, they had every right as apostles of Jesus Christ to expect to be fed, to expect to be ministered to. But in order to not be a burden, and in order to provide an example for these young believers, they literally worked long, hard hours, not only ministering the Word of God, but also tent making and providing income for themselves so that they would be able to eat while they were there. That was the example that was the model that they provided. Now, this word model can be translated also example, and it's the Greek word tupas from which we get our English word type, type. And I've got on this uh, next slide, I believe, if I remember correctly, yes, I've got four different examples where this word <clears throat> is used in the New Testament three times by the Apostle Paul and once by Peter, where Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, encourages the believers in, in Philippi to follow his example, to follow his way of living. He wrote to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 12, for Timothy to be an example or to be a model for those that received his testimony. He wrote the same thing to Titus in chapter 2 and verse 7. So we've got an apostle and then two pastors being used as models or examples of the Christian life. And then Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 3, a passage that, that John and I have alluded to multiple times in this church, that the elders and the shepherds are to be a model to the flock. We should hold our leaders accountable for the manner in which they live. You should do that. The scriptures lay that principle out clearly for us in the Word of God. Okay, that brings me to my third point. It's in keeping with personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. And I'm going to be spending um, a little bit of time uh, with this particular point because it's, it's an issue in the culture in which we live. It seems like not a day passes where 
there'll be something on the news or on some kind of broadcast which illustrates either an individual or a group of people refusing to take responsibility for their actions. Refusing to take responsibility for what they should be doing or for what they shouldn't have done. And it's a, it's a principle that's actually pretty evident <laughs> in our country. It's one that seems to be growing and becoming more influential. And it, it truly does um, stand in opposition, direct opposition, with the clear teaching of God's Word. So let's take a look at these verses in uh, chapter 3, 10 to 12, where discipline in the church is in keeping with personal responsibility. For even when we were with you, back in Acts chapter 17, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Now, what single word would you use to uh, describe verse 10 from a cultural point of view in this country? Um, or, or phrase, not a single word. A phrase. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. How would many people in our country describe that statement? It's harsh, right? It's mean-spirited. It's hateful. Uh, some people would call it, well, my goodness, I would never believe such a thing. That's politically incorrect, right? I mean, that's what it is. I mean, that's a politically incorrect statement. Praise God. It's politically incorrect. <laughs> it's the truth. If a person is able to work and they refuse to do so, the creator God of heaven and earth says there are consequences to your laziness. There are consequences to your unwillingness to do what I have created you to do, to be productive. And if you refuse to eat, then you will go hungry. That's what Paul is saying here. If you are able-bodied, if you are able to work, and you refuse to do so, then you will experience the consequences of your ungodly behavior. Namely, you're going to go hungry. Now, I want to make this clear. Paul is not talking about people who are in need who cannot provide for themselves. He's not talking about orphans. He's not talking about widows. Because in other passages, he clearly teaches that we should care for the needs of orphans and widows. That's a principle in the Old Testament. It's also a principle in the New Testament. It's also not talking about those who find themselves in such poverty that they cannot afford to eat. What are we called to do in such cases? We're, we're called to feed them and give them food. Now, that's not, that's not our primary directive. That's not our primary objective. But if we see someone who is in need physically, we're to help meet that physical need as we are able. What Paul has in view here are people who knowingly refuse to do what God has called them to do. You need to understand and you need to recognize that this is a command that has been given to the church of Jesus Christ. This is not a command that is given to unbelievers. This is a command that was given to the believers 
in the local church at Thessalonica, which Paul and Silas and Timothy helped to plant. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now, this is the heart of the passage. This is why he spends 10 verses dealing with the passage, or dealing with the principle. It's because he had received reports that, were, that there were some, some brothers and sisters in Christ who were living in such a way that they were dishonoring God. And they were going against the example that Paul and Silas and Timothy had set way back there in Acts chapter 17. Now, when he says, we've heard that some of you have been leading an undisciplined life, it's the verb form of Atoktos. Atokteo. The verb form. So, linking those concepts together. And they're doing no work at all. And instead, what are they doing? They're acting like busybodies. And this is, this is a really uh, interesting uh, term in the New Testament. And it, and it has the sense of, of someone who is engaging in getting involved in affairs that have nothing to do with him or her. And so instead of going about their business, going about their daily routines, going about what is expected of them from a biblical point of view, they get involved in other people's affairs for whatever reason. And the Apostle Paul is making it undeniably clear that such activity and such a lifestyle, it is not acceptable within the body of Christ. It doesn't honor our Lord. Now, such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. So if you want to if you want to eat if you're able bodied if you want to eat the biblical principle is get a job find some work be productive honor God with your life And it's not simply eating food. We work in order to earn a living so that we might have a place to live, so that we might have clothes to wear, so that we might have food to eat, and so that we might have resources to give to the work of the ministry. So that we might have resources to bless and encourage people who are less fortunate than us. So that we might have resources to minister in a biblical way to people who can't fend for themselves. Orphans and widows. Work and eat. It's pretty simple, right? Pretty simple. Work and eat. Now I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I'm going to read for you a portion of Paul's teaching and instruction with regard to widows. I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. 
Honor widows who are widows indeed. Now what Paul is saying in verse 3 here is you should financially support and provide for widows who are in a position where their needs are not being met. That's what he's saying here. And he'll expound upon this in the following verses. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. So if a widow has grown children, then those grown children should take care of that widow. They should take care of their mother. Or if that widow has grown grandchildren, those grandchildren should take care of their grandmother. And it should not be, it should not be the financial responsibility of the local church. It should be the, the responsibility first for the extended family. If there is extended family. For this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. Now here's the verse I want you to focus on. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, here's the context of that verse. Let's say, well, let's use me as an example. Uh, my dear mother is with my dear sister today in Springfield, Ohio. Um, typically, she's an attender of Fellowship Bible Chapel. Let me use her as an example. As her son and daughter, I, along with my sister, are responsible for caring for our mother. All three of us are believers in Christ. And so that responsibility lays upon my sister and me. And if we do not provide for her, if we do not help care for her needs, it is like denying our faith in Jesus Christ. I would never think of denying my faith in Christ. I would rather die and I don't use those words lightly, then deny the one who died for me in order that I might have life. But if I, if I don't help to take care of my mother, and if I don't help to provide for her needs, then I have denied the faith, and Paul says at the end of verse 8, I'm worse than an unbeliever. Why would he say such a thing? There's unbelievers out there who provide for their <laughs> widowed mothers and don't do it because of their faith in Christ because they don't even know Christ. So we need to keep that principle, we need to keep that principle in mind when we talk about work and eat in the body of Christ. One other passage I'd, I'd like you to look at quickly is Gal Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, bearing one another's burdens. I'll begin reading in verse 1, and I'll read through verse 5. Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. 
So if someone falls into sin, we need to gather around that individual, call them to repent, do so with a spirit of gentleness, do so with humility, do so looking at our own lives and our own hearts, lest we too be tempted. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Burdens are meant to be shared in the body of Christ. Burdens, let me say that again. Burdens are meant to be shared in the body of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one shall bear his own load. The Bible makes a distinction between burdens and loads. My load is my responsibility before God. There's only one person in this room that's called to be the husband of Jerry Clapham. And most of you are looking at him right now. That's me. That's my load. That's not a burden. That's a privilege. That's a joy. That's my responsibility before Jesus Christ. But then there's burdens. I had a burden this week, and I asked one of you to pray for me, and you did. And God ministered through that prayer. And I thank you for praying. I didn't name the burden. I just asked for prayer. And God lifted that burden when prayer was lifted up. We should bear one another's burdens. At the same time, each person is bearing their own load. Okay. Let's move on to our last point this morning. Discipline within the church is in keeping with church discipline. <laughs> Interesting. If you're unruly and undisciplined and you refuse to repent, then you are to be disciplined by the church. Look at verses 13 to 15. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. And that's talking about being disciplined, being orderly, being productive, working, providing, caring for needs. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And in the context, he's talking about the command to not be unruly. The command to lead a discipline in life. We're not to associate with that person, yet don't regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, this phrase, do not associate, it only appears three times in the New Testament. And the other two places where it appears, it's in a church discipline passage. In fact, the classic church discipline passage, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 5, where a man in the church at Corinth was having sexual relations with his stepmother in the open. And the church <laughs> was reveling in the grace of God in their midst that they had the freedom to do such things. And Paul <laughs> put an immediate halt to that practice and called the believers in the church of Corinth to repent of their sin. And he turned the individual who was claiming to be a Christian and was having sexual relations with his stepmother, he turned him literally over to Satan in order to demonstrate whether or not he was a believer. If he was a believer, he would repent of his sin and get right with God. 
if he was an unbeliever, he would continue on in that sin. Now, we know from the book of 2 Corinthians that, that this person w was a believer, and he did repent, <laughs> but the church in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, after he re repented, didn't receive him back into fellowship. And so Paul had to admonish the church, except this brother, he's repented, he's demonstrated his belief. So he writes in, in verse 9 and 11 of 1 Corinthians 5, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. That's church discipline. If they refuse to repent, we can't, we can't have anything to do with them other than admonition. That's all we can do. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this, in this letter, take special note of that person. Do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame, so that he will recognize his sin, because it will be out in the open, and he will be called to repentance. The goal of church discipline is always, always, always the restoration of genuine believers. That's always the goal, and we should always pray to that end. All right. And here's the second point. Don't treat him like an enemy. You know, he's, 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 he's living an undisciplined life. He's living an unruly life. He's causing shame to the cause of Christ. He's in open rebellion to the will of God in his life as a Christian. But don't treat him as an enemy. Remember, he's a brother, and that brother needs to be restored. And the process by which he's restored is through biblical admonition. Now, it's the Greek word nuthateo is the verb. Nuthateo, and this verb is used all of eight times in the New Testament, and I have all eight references listed here on the slide. Uh, two references from Colossians and uh, two references from 1 Thessalonians. In each and every one, this word is used in a context where one believer or one local church is to admonish, warn, exhort another believer. It's always believer with believer. It's not a term that is used outside the church. It is not a term that is used in evangelism. They need, they need to repent and believe in the gospel, and if they do, then they will be in a position where they will be receptive to biblical admonition. But I want us to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, in closing today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, because it provides for us some context as to why Paul wrote what he did in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Admonish the unruly. At this point, it's, it's not a toctos, the adverb. It's a toctos, the adjective. One letter difference. Instead of an omega, there's an omicron. Or put it in another way, instead of a long O, there's a short O, a toctos. It means exactly the same thing. One is an adverb, 
One is an adjective. And Paul says, admonish, nuthateo, the octoctos, the unruly. So, here's the background of this whole passage. Paul and Silas and Timothy gave the believers in Thessalonica an example to follow when they planted the church in Acts chapter 17. When they wrote, or when Paul wrote, the book of 1 Thessalonians, one of the specific instructions was for the church to admonish or warn or exhort anyone who is leading an undisciplined life. Fast forward to 2 Thessalonians. Paul is concluding the book, and in his conclusion, he ends with this command to stay aloof from those who are unruly and to not associate with those who are undisciplined. But to not treat them as an enemy, but admonishing them as a brother in Christ. Because the goal is to restore them into fellowship. And that is achieved when they repent of their sin. So, how can we summarize this? I actually put this in a summary form. You know, my, my wife, she is so helpful. How many of you husbands out there have wives who are helpful? Okay, put your hands in here. Okay. They immediately lit up. Wow, we are such a well-trained group. We are, we are exceedingly well-trained. Our wives are so helpful. Now, sometimes they help us, and because of the, the weakness and frailty of our own flesh, at that particular moment in time, we're not un unusually receptive to their help. But, but sometimes we are, and that's a good thing. And, and my wife, she's a helpful person. I, I thank God for her. And, you know, she, she's so practical. She'll, say, she'll th say things like, okay, so you've got this big Bible study, and you're going to, you know, you, you're going to take this, this dump truck and, 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 like, unload all of this stuff, you know, and, you know, what is the point, okay? What, what do you want them to leave with? And, and, and sometimes, you know, I'm lost in, you know, in, in, in the teaching and the theology and the, and the instruction, and I don't take enough time to think through the practical implications. Well, my wife is, like, she majors on that stuff. And, and she encouraged me, you know, what's going to be your main point? And it was like this light bulb went off. You know, I, I need to do this kind of thing whenever I preach and just put it in some reform. It just... It's just so helpful. So here's the message in one paragraph. Work as God intended from the beginning. Genesis 2.15. Submitting yourselves to the authority of Christ and his apostles, following their example as well as the example of your elders and shepherds, not associating with those who refuse to work until such time as they are restored. That's the message. So, with that in mind, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for the privilege of sharing your word. And I ask, Father, that you might bless this message. Father, in the quietness of our own hearts and minds right now, I pray that you would help us to embrace the teaching of this passage, that we would embrace work as a worthy thing that comes from you. Father, help us to also be perceptive and to be understanding and discerning with regard to people who can't provide for themselves and who are genuinely in need. And help us to be people of compassion in those situations. But Father, as we close in prayer, I also want to emphasize that this message was to believers. It is for believers.
in relation to other believers. And Father, today there might be somebody here who doesn't yet know Jesus Christ by faith. They've never acknowledged their sin before you. They've never turned from their sin and cried out to the Lord to save them from their sin. They've never put their faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on their behalf. Father, if there's anyone in this room or anyone who listens to our broadcast that doesn't yet know you, Father, I pray that they would come to you, that they would repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I ask this, Father, in his name. Amen. If you'd all please.